How's it going, Tread? We are back again for our next step on the Baptist Faith and Message. And this week, as I told you, we're going to be looking at the purpose of God's grace. And we're going to be talking about a couple of terms during this session that I think a lot of Christians struggle with and deal with. So tonight's lesson is going to be a little bit maybe deeper than what we would talk about on a Wednesday night. But I think it's a a very vital part of what we are building in this process. And that is, what do we believe uh, as Baptists, but more importantly, as believers, as Christians? What is it that we stand for? What is it that the things of Scripture talks about? And so tonight, what we're going to be doing is looking at the article of God's purpose, and we will be referring to terms as election and free will. These are two things that a lot of Christians struggle with today in understanding, as well as um, how it applies to our lives as Christians. We just got done talking about salvation in the last two sessions, and salvation being God's process of saving us from our sin through the blood of Christ, through faith in Him. As we begin to go into this next section, it's going to be an extension of what we looked at over the last two weeks in the sense of what happened before that moment of salvation, what was going on. Uh, prior to that, the work of the Holy Spirit in someone who is not a believer. And that is what we're going to look at today. So I'm going to read to you the article, and then we're going to start breaking down some of the things that are in our article today. So this is what article number five, the God's purpose of grace says. Election is the gracious purpose of God, according to which he regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. It is consistent with the free will or the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It is a glorious display of God's sovereign goodness and his infinite wisdom, holy and unchangeable. It includes or excludes boasting and promotes humility. All true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by his spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but they shall persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect or temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair their graces and comfort, and bring reproach or discipline to the cause of Christ and temporal judgment on themselves. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation." John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Tonight, we're going to look at election and free will a little bit deeper. And if these are terms you're not familiar with, you will hear people arguing different sides of what it means to be elected and what free will means. And as we look at the article tonight, I want us to understand that salvation is initiated and done by God. I want us to understand that as we went through salvation the last two weeks, we made the comment that we have to understand what it is that we have to be saved from. And what that is, is God's wrath and judgment against sin which we are sinners. In order to be saved, we must have faith in Christ and what he has done. Believe and follow Christ as our Savior. You see, salvation is God's eternal purpose. The grace that he has, that unmerited favor that we discussed last week, is God's wonderful, perfect plan of salvation even before there was sin. Even before Adam and Eve fell, God had a plan to redeem the lost. You see, it is God's purpose. And it is God who begins the process of salvation within us. As we go into this first section of the article, it says, elect of the believers. And election is a doctrine of the Bible and a very central part of the Bible. And here is the struggle that we see. The doctrine of election explains God's grace 
and how he brings salvation to his people. The definition of election is God's gracious action in choosing people to follow him and obey his commands. The struggle that we see is that election takes us out of the picture. Election is, it's hard for us as humans to understand and grasp because what we're saying is God out there is the one choosing and and taking care of salvation in my life instead of me. It takes away the, the boasting and the pride that I might have in my own works and my own abilities. And that's hard for us as people to admit that we are not capable of saving ourselves. But before we get to that point, I want us to remind ourselves of the Old Testament and how this is not something new that some scholar came up with. If you look at the Old Testament, even as in Deuteronomy and Isaiah and Exodus, and we see the interactions of God with Israel, what we see is God choosing the nation of Israel. He chose them to be his people. They were not the most mighty nation. They were not the best nation. They were not the richest nation. They were not any of those things. But yet God chose them to be his people. And through them, he was glorified and he brought about salvation to the rest of the world. So we see that God's purpose and election is in him, not in me. It's not something that I deserve or earn. It is God's choosing to work in a person's heart to draw him to himself. You see, one of the verses that we read was, The sheep hear my voice, and they will never be plucked from my hand. You see, we have a purpose. God's purpose in our lives we may not understand completely yet, but God's purpose is present. Those whom he will reach in and work in and the Holy Spirit brings about salvation in, they are saved. And that is what we're going to begin breaking down today. And so I understand that maybe we have not spent a lot of time on the word election, but it is a huge part of Scripture. It is a doctrinal statement that we see throughout Scripture where God is sovereign. He is over all things. And if we say he's not over all things, then we have to say he's not love and he's not perfect and he's not holy. We can't take one characteristic of God and get rid of it and then believe the other ones. God is God or he is not. That is up to you to to come to as a person, as an individual. You see, the next part of the Baptist Faith and Message article talks about election and God's choosing and working in and his grace towards man needs to be understood from this perspective. God's grace is undeserved. We as people do not deserve to be saved. We do not deserve to have grace by God, but yet He gives it. And when He chooses to give it, that is something we must understand is a gracious action in itself to give grace to someone who did not deserve it in the first place. It is God's choice and His will to bring salvation to the lost. So when we say, well, what if He chooses one or another? That's not for us to decide. That's the the part sometimes where we don't comprehend the complexity of God, but we do know that God is sovereign. His will is perfect. But what we do get to glorify in and be thankful in is the fact that God works in those whom he saves, even though we do not deserve that work. But we also take into account the idea of man's free will and responsibility. I use that word responsibility because when we talk about election, what we're talking about is God working in, God initiating, God being the one to start that process of salvation within that person's heart. God is the one who chooses and reaches in. But man is responsible for our actions and our choices as individuals. We are falling within the bounds, as the Baptist faith and message says, as our our free will or our free agency and responsibility. Charles Spurgeon actually says that these are two wonderful truths that are almost impossible to truly fully comprehend. It says, I am not sure that in heaven we will even be able to understand where the free agency of man 
and the sovereignty of God meet, but they are both great truths. Charles Spurgeon was a great, great pastor of the Reformation, and during the times um, many, many years ago where people were coming to know Christ through the preaching of the Word. And even he struggled with understanding how all of that fit together specifically. But we see Scripture tell us that we have the, the choice to believe and the choice to commit to Christ, but the work is done by God first. Go with me to Romans. We're going to look at two chapters in Romans tonight. The first one we're going to look at is going to be Romans chapter um, 10, I believe. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we're going to see that um, Scripture describes this idea of free will, this idea of man uh, responding. It says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you have believed and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all, richly blessing all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is where we see some of those doctrines um, of people choosing or free will being displayed. And I do think that there is a part of that that goes with the step that we're looking at tonight in this article. We are responsible for the, the actions and choices of our lives. And as a believer in Christ, I am responsible, as we see at the end of the article, for things like sin in my life. Things that keep coming up in my life or things that I allow in my life that can cause harm to the spirit and grieving the spirit that can cause uh, discipline to me as an individual. I am responsible for my response to God's working in my heart, but I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. And when we look at Romans chapter 8 verses 29 and 30, it says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined or elected to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among brothers and sisters, and those whom he predestined he also called, those who he called he justified, those who he justified he also glorified. You can see some of the references to the things that we covered last week in Romans chapter 8. God works in and calls and draws them to him. It is my response to that call and that draw that completes the process. But ultimately what we see is that we as Christians are not saved by our own devices and our own strength. You see, throughout church history, we have struggled with trying to recognize free will and election. Charles Spurgeon also says this, election to a saint or a believer is one of the most stripping doctrines in the world. It takes away all trust in the flesh and only reliance on anything other than Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. It takes away all trust in the flesh or all reliance on anything other than Jesus Christ. How often do we wrap ourselves in our own righteousness or array ourselves in false pearls and gems of our own works, we begin to say things like, now I shall be saved because I've done this or that as evidence. Instead, it is the naked faith that saves. It is the faith in that alone that unites the Lamb, irrespective of works, outside of whatever it is that we think we can do, although it is productive of them. You see, we struggle with this idea of election because it takes us out of the picture. It takes all faith and trust in myself and removes it. And it says, I trust that God is the one working in my life. I trust that God is the one that is doing things in my life and in the world around me. And we struggle when maybe it's someone we know that is not a believer. And we say, well, what if God doesn't choose them? That's not for me to decide. 
It is for me to share the gospel. And it is for God to change the heart. And as we look at this idea of election, what we're seeing is God working in, initiating, beginning the process of salvation. And when those who will be called to God hear the call, they respond. The free will and responsibility of our life. The next part of this section that he talks about in in the article of the faith and message is that we will endure to the end. Election or the salvation of those who would believe is an incredible experience. And then what we see is that does not disappear over time. True believers, true followers of Christ will endure through the sanctification of their life. We said last week that sanctification is the process by which we grow more mature and more holy as we go through life. You see, we have to understand that we do understand and believe that once we are truly saved by God, we will never be thrown away. We are truly confirmed in Christ forever. There is no falling out of salvation and back into salvation and out of salvation. It is, we are saved. But we do have to understand that just because someone claims to be a believer, that doesn't necessarily mean it is true. I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to to misstate or say something that I should not. But ultimately, A person who confesses with their mouth but lives a life contrary to God, according to Scripture, is someone who is a false prophet or a false teacher. They are ultimately saying, I confess God with my mouth, but I do not follow God with my heart and my life. You see, just because someone makes the claim of salvation doesn't make it true. Therefore, we must be careful in understanding that As Baptists, we believe that once saved, always saved, doesn't just mean that somebody says, well, okay, I'm a saved then. There is a true transformation of the heart, a salvation that occurs within the heart of a believer. And then we see that lifelong process, that idea of being sanctified throughout our lives. It's something that goes on and on and on. It's not a one day or a one week process. The lifelong process of salvation or sanctification, as we talked about last week, is a daily process of God working in our hearts, showing us sin, removing sin, repenting of sin, turning to God, following God, and building that relationship and maturity in our lives. You see, true believers that follow after God with their whole heart may fall away in sin, meaning they might be tempted into a particular sin or they might be tempted into a particular thing. Let's say there's bitterness or there's gossip. You know, heaven forbid that there's adultery or or lust or sin of the flesh. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we're no longer human. We still battle against the flesh, as the Bible says. But a believer in Christ begins to see sin as as an act against God and it begins to hurt our heart. It begins to bother us and then convict us as we see sin in our lives. It doesn't mean that we're perfect and never sin, but it means that ultimately a true believer will see the sin in their lives and soon become convicted. It may take six months, it may take six years, But they become convicted of the sin that is in their heart and they become convicted of the sin that is in their life and they repent and turn from it. You see, as we've read throughout Scripture before, there is the parable of the soils and you have one soil that is hard and rocky and that doesn't even uh, begin to grow. Those that hear the Word of God and reject it. Then there's ground that is kind of rocky and kind of good soil and there's maybe they spring up real quick and they start to kind of believe but then they they die and fall away these would be people that maybe profess with their mouth but don't really believe then you have those that are thrown among the thorns where they start to grow but the thorns choke them out the worries of the world and all of the things happening around them again someone who maybe hears the gospel uh, 
likes what they hear, but doesn't actually uh, commit their life to Christ. And then there's the good soil where the seed lands and grows and produces fruit. The key term here is fruit. The response of our life and result of Christ. Emmy Dodds says this, This doctrine of the safety of the child of God encourages the holiest living among God's children, for it has behind it the most holy and mighty of motivations that control the heart of men and women. It has, or if, I can be saved by the grace of God and His and he is responsible for my salvation, and he has given me the word that he will save me, and all we are to do is to leave it to him. Out of love and gratitude towards him, I will give him the deepest and most consecrated service of my life for what he has done. You see, Pastor Emmy Dodds is reminding us that when we look at this idea of those who have admitted their sin, confessed their sins, repented of their sins, and turned towards Christ and committed their life to believe Him and follow Him, have been secured forever. And because of that grace that we did not deserve, and because of the love that God shared that we did not deserve, we can be motivated to follow after Him and to serve Him no matter what because of what He has done. It's not because I have to check off certain boxes. It's because I didn't deserve to be saved in the first place. But Christ died so that I may be saved. God gave grace so that I may be saved. And in response to that, in my free will to that, I lovingly serve Him because of what He has done. But as we go through this lifelong process, we understand that we are protected and covered and secured by God's grace. The doctrine of security of the believer teaches us that true believers are eternally saved and therefore secured in their salvation. Romans 8.38 says, Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, no power, no height, no depth, nor any other created thing will have power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I close this section with this thought. This is a hard subject. I could spend probably more time getting into deeper conversations about what does it mean to be elect or elect and what it means to have free will. And those are questions that we can dig deeper into if you have questions about that. But ultimately what we see is God is sovereign, perfect, holy. And when he works in the lives of those whom he will save, he is justified in doing so. Because he would have been justified to destroy the entire earth again after Noah because of the sin of man. But instead, in his love and his grace for those whom he created, he sent his son to die in your place and in my place. All we must do is believe. Last week we talked about salvation. Believing and having faith in Christ was a commitment. It was an understanding that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that He came to live a perfect life. I believe that He died on the cross for my sins. I believe that He rose again. I believe that He is back in heaven with His Father. And I believe that He sits on the right hand of God to intercede for me and my sin. I believe in who Christ is and what Christ has done then I am saved. After salvation comes the life of living after Christ and serving Him, being sanctified in our lives. But we can understand that God's purpose for grace was to save those who would be saved by Him and to live a life in service for Him. That was the purpose of God's grace for us was to save us and secure us for His glory and His honor. As we close tonight, I want to say again, if there's ever a question, if there's ever a comment that I have said that you do not understand, if there's a verse that maybe you've been struggling with, please send it to us. Send it through Facebook Messenger. Catch us at church sometime on a Sunday morning. I would hope that if you have 
concerns or needs in your heart and your life, uh, please reach out to us. Ask those questions and we will do our best to answer them for you. As we continue on into our next step, we are going to be looking at the Baptist faith and message step of the church. What is the church? What does it do? What are we, what are we supposed to be a part of? And as we go into that next step, we are going to be seeing what it is that we as believers can be doing in the local church as well as the universal church. So I hope that you will join me next week as we begin to look at some of the pieces that come along next. We've talked about who we are. We've talked about who God is. We've talked about what scripture is and means. We've talked about being saved from sin. We understand what God's grace is tonight. And now we begin looking ahead. As we look at the next several sessions, we're going to be looking at the church and what is baptism? What is the Lord's day? What is the kingdom of God? What are the things that we're supposed to be doing in evangelism and missions? How do we be good stewards of the things that God has given and, and many other things that we have ahead of us? So I hope that you will continue to join us here on Wednesdays as we begin to get closer and closer to school starting again in August. We will be gathering back together soon, hopefully. And so stay tuned for information on that and when the start dates will be and all of those things. Hope that you guys are having a safe summer. Hope that you will be uh, gathering together with me this week as well as next week as we look at the next step. And if you have questions, please send them to us. Stay tuned to the Facebook page and our website for any new information. If you would, I would ask that you bow with me tonight and I'll see you guys next week. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I just I come to you tonight to help us to understand that when we talk about some of these things in our faith and our doctrine, they are hard, they're difficult. We don't always understand what it means to, to hear terms like predestined or elect. Help us to study the meaning of the, the words and understand that sometimes salvation comes through brokenness and understanding our sin. But Lord, it's also a beautiful thing to know that you have came through your son to die in our place to give us salvation. Lord, if there be any that are watching tonight that do not know you, I pray that you will work in the hearts of those who do not. And if there are those that are listening tonight that know you, but they need direction in their life, I pray that you would reveal to them through your word what it is that you have for them to do. I pray for wisdom and strength as we continue through this series, as we can draw closer and closer to uh, being back together again and studying your word together, I pray for wisdom. I pray for salvation for those who would seek after you. I pray that you would be diligent in seeking after our hearts, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.